today we're going to look at the Passover. Okay, so uh, I'll begin with the story. There's a man named Brian, and he's unemployed. And what he does with his spare time, rather than look for work, he tends to sit at home watching TV during the day and socialising in the evening with his friends. So uh, he goes to sign on one day, and the job centre asks him, what have you been doing to look for work this past two weeks? He replies, to be honest, nothing really. I've just been sitting at home watching Jeremy Kyle. <laughs> so uh, as a result of that, his money gets stopped. And then after that, he realises that he should have been looking for work rather than sitting at home watching Jeremy Carr. It's a bit like a few years ago, I used to play my Xbox all day. And one day, whilst playing it, it decided to break. The CD tray just didn't work anymore. So I got really angry. And then after a while, I realised, why am I getting angry? It's a good thing. Because I was spending my time on something I shouldn't have been. So, I ended up feeling good about it. <laughs> so, let's delve deep into the word. So, if you turn to Exodus 12, verses 24 to 32. At this time in history, God's people are in slavery in Egypt. And God has sent Moses to free them. And he's sent several plagues already. And he's about to unveil the, unravel the final plague. And he's also instructed Moses and commanded him, commanded him to tell the Israelites about how to avoid this final plague. So we'll pick off there. Okay, 24. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, oh, leave my people, you and the Israelites go. Worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go, and also bless me. So let's start with a quick run through of the passage. It starts off, firstly, with some instructions and commands of a lasting ordinance. After that, we see a question, a hypothetical one. And the question is, what does this ceremony mean to you? And then we're given the answer, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And then the answer is, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, and spared our home when he struck down the Egyptians. So then after that, you see that the Israelites obeyed the instructions and worshipped God. And then after that we see that the final plague is released and the Egyptians firstborn die or firstborn of the livestock die as well. And then we see the Egyptians getting up in the middle of the night and finding out what's happened and there's the crying out, wailing as it says. And then after that Moses and Aaron get summoned, don't they? And then they're told to go. 
and I'm also less bearer. So now we've gone over the text. The next part we should do now is let's look at some other things. Okay, so if we go to 2 Samuel, because we'll be looking at, at that in a second. Did you notice that when Pharaoh released the Egyptian, the uh, Israelites, it was only because his son had died, or mm. after his son had died? It's just like Brian, isn't it? He only realised he should be looking for work after he mm. had his money stopped. You know, it'd be like me with my Xbox as well. After it broke, it was all good. Okay, so, if we look at 2, um, two Samuel 12, there's an, another story. It's where Nathan rebukes David. And I'll read it for you. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and he grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from t taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare, prepare a meal to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Now that made David angry, didn't it? Mm. And in fact, he said that the rich man should die because of that. But then Nathan tells David that he is the rich man. And um, it really hit home for David. And he turned around and he said that he has sinned against the Lord. So, next time something bad happens in your life, maybe you do something wrong and someone finds out, don't get angry about it. Just think there was a reason why they found out. So uh, we see that Pharaoh only released the Israelites after his son dies. Then after that, David, in here, he only realises his sin afterwards mm. when he has been rebuked. And then Jesus experienced hardship throughout his whole life. But there's no reason behind it for him in terms of him realising something. Through it. And then, because Jesus, he lived a perfect life, didn't he? And then, even, he suffered on the cross as well. Mm. And that was for us. So, I think we owe Jesus our lives mm. because of that. And because we're in Christ, when we go through some hardships, there is a reason behind it. It could be, for example, to discipline us for something we've done wrong. Or it could even be just to challenge us. Mm. And I think today, God is trying to tell us that we're all sinners. And sometimes we don't realise it until we go through something bad. But at the same time, I think sin is also telling us, don't worry about it, to be honest, it's hardship only temporary, so just don't worry about it. In fact, it's not even your fault. <laughs> You've done nothing wrong. But unfortunately, that's not true. So, well, fortunately, shall I say. And then, uh, I think, if you're at home, for example, something breaks, don't worry about it. Just think, first of all, was I relying on that too much? Because it could be. If you're at work and something goes wrong, for example, and something happens, your boss screams at you, for example, just think to yourself, is there something that needs to be addressed about me? If you're walking through the streets and you see a homeless person, don't just cover your head, try and ignore them, 
people they couldn't see you, so you can't you can't see them, they can't see you. Mm. Maybe go over to them, offer to buy them a cup of coffee or something, to have a chat, maybe even bring them the gospel. There's an opportunity. Mm. And if you see your brothers and sisters in the church go through hard times, it's an opportunity to go over there, talk to them, and say, just to remind them that there could be something that God is trying to show them mm. about their own life. So, Jesus, he, led, he lived a perfect life, suffered on the cross for us, so that we could go back to God. So, I think the least we can do is, when we get hardship in our life, don't complain about it, just get on with it. So, I think, any time something some trouble comes up, just think to yourself, is God trying to show me something mm -hmm. through this? Maybe even pray, say, God, please reveal something 